Hello, everyone. A very good evening to all of you. I am Shayani Dave, and I welcome all of you to this webinar by Medical Superficiality Hospital in association with Rotary Club of Calcutta, Aviana. So it is uh, the month of September, and we observe this month as a suicide prevention month. Now, uh, we all know suicide is a very sensitive issue. Uh, suicidal thoughts, much like mental health conditions, can affect anyone regardless of age, gender, or background. In fact, suicide is often the result of an untreated mental condition. Suicidal thoughts, although common, should not be considered normal and often indicate more serious issues. Failed attempt at suicide may be perceived as lucky for the survivor, but they're often left immensely scarred, both physically and mentally, with deep impact on their near and dear ones too. So to set some light, some light on this topic, we have two eminent speakers with us today from Medical Superficiality Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Avril Roy, internal medicine and critical care specialist of Medical Superficiality Hospital, and Ms. Anushila Brahmachari, psychologist and counselor, Medical Superficiality Hospital. Good evening. So, Anushila, hi. Hi, Shaini. So, my first question to you uh, today is, what leads to a suicide attempt? Right. Thank you for the question, Shaini. Uh, in one line, if I have to say, any chronic or acute stressor can be a potential reason for a person to attempt suicide. Now, if you see, there are two kinds of suicide attempts. One is planned and the other one is spontaneous. And if you look at the statistics, the rate of spontaneous attempts of suicide is much more because it is a byproduct of a momentary lapse of reason. And there can be two categories of reasons. One is chronic and the other one is acute. Acute, say for example, a sudden breakup, right. a sudden, sudden loss of a family member, anything that has shocked you so intensely that you have lost your ability of reasoning at that moment and you feel that it is easier for you to end your life than to cope with it. The planned one is different and potentially more dangerous because that seems like a more persistent uh, attempt or pursuit because where the person who is attempting is planning the whole event over a long period of time and then going for it, the statistics again say that the chances of success is higher in those cases. Mm -hmm. The chronic uh, conditions, say chronic depression, or even say chronic health conditions, people who are going through terminal health conditions or uh, dealing with uh, chronic pain conditions who find it extremely difficult to pass each day may often flatten such incidents. Like you also mentioned that existing mental health conditions, say for example, people suffering from delusion or any other form of psychotic disorder can also feel compelled to attempt suicide under the influence of their delusion or the hallucinations they are encountering. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, uh, if there is any family history of uh, suicide, then a, an individual becomes more uh, susceptible or vulnerable to the attempt or uh, basically they fail to handle their stressors and they feel more uh, prone to ending their lives at different stress, uh, stressful events. The most important thing would be mm -hmm. a previous attempt. This is one very important marker because if you see the statistics, the uh, WHO statistics says that uh, on an average there are seven lakh suicides happening every year. And the number of attempts are even more every year. And fortunately, we can save those people. but the successful events are often preceded by certain attempts. So when there is an, a case of attempt, we have to pay extra attention and look at it as an opportunity for us to save those people from future attempts by addressing their problems. 
That's a very interesting insight. And uh, so is there any way of identifying uh, an individual who is like about to attempt suicide? Right. This, this, is, this is really interesting. No. In one word, no. We often see it in the movies, right? That um, our heroine is going for a party, having a great time. She's well dressed. Coming back, suddenly she chooses to jump off her terrace. Well, as dramatic as it may seem, it is possible. Because the new age phase of depression has completely changed. Earlier when we used to talk about depression, we used to imagine a very sad person dressed in tatters, sitting in the corner of the room. Well, depression has taken a completely new phase, which is fully functional. You can do your day's activities perfectly well, and yet the depression is brewing so much inside you that at one moment you can still choose to end your life. But there can be certain markers that, that are very subtle in nature. I would say in one word that it's really difficult to identify a person who is about to attempt because in many cases the individual himself or herself is not, not aware of it. Particularly when there is a lapse of reason, it's a spur of a moment thing. But in a planned case, if the person is talking about suicide a lot, if the person is giving away personal belongings, if the person makes comments like, uh, don't worry, you guys will not have to worry about me anymore. I have been troubling you a lot. I am making sure that I redeem you from this bother. Mm -hmm. If such comments are repeatedly coming from people, we may take it as a red flag. But otherwise, there is no definite uh, identifier. Mm -hmm. Right. Dr. Roy, would you like to add to this? Oh, hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Anushila. She's given a great uh, overview on what a lot of people would say are the first few signs as what they might be planning, especially for plan. Unplanned, like she said, most of them don't even know what they're doing. And even if they do come into the hospital and, you know, when you ask them like what happened and they're, and they're number one, I don't know what I was thinking. It's, it's just a complete momentary lack of reasoning and judgment and it very often baffles them as well. Like, you know what, I was just walking by, I had maybe I was on the bridge or walking over, a, over an overpass. I don't know, I was thinking or, you know, they have a bunch of pills, they had alcohol with them and they just did something and, you know, they don't, they often, they don't often understand it themselves. It is a spur of the moment thing, they thought about it and they acted upon it. Usually these are the ones, these are the times where they may not necessarily be fully in control of their mental faculties. Like they said, had a party, had a few drinks, maybe they're on medicines, might be unwell. A recent a massive stressor in the family where their usual uh, coping mechanisms, maybe be friend, be family, may not have been acutely available. And as Anushila said as well, uh, the planned ones are the ones that are usually Usually the people who attempt on the spur of the moment, they have not planned it out. And hence those may tend to be more survivable because they've not thought it out, right? They may not have thought, the, you know, how I'm going to do, what am I going to do? Is it the right way to do things? Whereas the ones who have planned it out, they have done the research behind it, what's the way to do it. And uh, it, at that point, they're not crying out for help. It's not a call for help or a call to attention. It's, it's, it's a very definitive plan that this is what I want to do. They've reasoned it out. They've thought over it. Don't, so don't are mis it. Exactly. Don't misinterpret me saying they reasoned it out. So it's, it's valid reasoning. It might be totally invalid mm -hmm. reasoning, but in their mind, it's completely valid. Mm -hmm. And then these people, these are the ones who do this are usually the ones who tend to have worse outcomes down the line. Mm -hmm. And like Anushila said, the number one predictor is what's called suicide. The, the medical term for it is suicidal ideation. Whereas they've been thinking about it. They've been discussing it with their friends. You know, they might've been searching for, for Google. They might've been looking up drugs. They might've shown a cue, you know, an increased tendency to talk about really depressing things or, you know, things that they might've heard in the past. So this is where, you know, getting history from family, talking to family or social mechanisms, and basically a show social structure in picking up early signs is really, really important. True, very true. So uh, also, uh, Anushila, uh, what are the you know, primary uh, reactions that are seen after a, you know, a, a patient uh, survives uh, a suicide attempt? Right. So um, 
there are two forms of reactions we see one from the person who has attempted and the other from the near and dear ones yeah. uh, in my experience the first um, reaction that we get from uh, the person who has attempted mm. is when they open their eyes in fortunately if they open their eyes in the hospital bed and we have managed to save the person the first thing that we see is shame what is everyone around me thinking about my attempt because it is not there's a lot of taboo associated with an attempted suicide uh, incident yeah. so everybody is looking at me what are they thinking what are they feeling about me are they judging so there's a shame in cases which are a product of um, spontaneous attempt there is also a, a, a carried guilt simultaneously mm -hmm. so these are the primary things that you see and then what dr roy said that is also there th there's a complete baffling effect they are completely at a loss they don't know what they have done and what has happened and how they ended up in a hospital bed so often there is a temporary loss of memory also because what they have done has been a shock to their mind and body both and the mind often tends to you know shut it out and they are not sure when we take case history of patients for the first time it takes them a lot of time to revive the memory they just they just keep saying that we were in a lot of pain and we couldn't deal with it most of them say i'm not saying all of them most of them say we were in a lot of pain and we couldn't deal with it and hence we, we took such a step but what happened during that step it often gets lost and there's a shame associated with it the reactions from the family members are more important because they will guide the rehabilitation of the patient thereafter the first thing that you can often see is how could you do such a thing to us and when you ask such a question the burden of guilt becomes very high on the patient and it becomes less about the patient and more about the uh, you know the helplessness that the family is feeling so uh, such reactions happen they often feel sorrow what did we do wrong uh, how could you do this you could have spoken to us you could have talked to us so it often becomes a lot about the family members i don't blame them they also get very shocked about such uh, incidents but the family members ought to remember that we have to keep the focus on the patient the physical and the emotional rehabilitation of the patient so that further attempts can be prevented mm -hmm. and they have to act as a supporting agent to the process of rehabilitation and not and not so much uh, about themselves if they need help themselves it is important that they seek help from other family members or even professionals if required so these are the initial reactions that we identify right right uh, may i just uh, you know uh, i'll just take a few minutes i'll, I'll welcome uh, rotarian uh, apala datta president uh, rotary club of calcutta viana she has joined welcome ma'am also vice president rotarian uh, sheila jankiram welcome ma'am good evening uh, so uh, anushila also uh, you know i have a person known to me uh, so so she is like uh, so there's a difference between you know sadness and depression so it is very difficult to define and uh, if i am going through depression am i really sad or i am depressed so how how does one kind of define that what right uh, we use this term depression i'm feeling depressed oh my god um, my exam went so bad i'm feeling so depressed about it i hear it a lot from my young uh, clients hmm. Hmm. and casually also the word depression has been used so there is a potential difference between sadness and depression sadness hmm. is just, is an emotion which is common for all of us we will and we are entitled to feel sad at different points of our lives it's a regular emotion just like we feel happy and joyous at different points we are supposed to feel sad and disappointed at different points also yeah. but if the sadness becomes very chronic that means it lasts for a long period of time 
if it tends to get over the better of you, if it tends to dominate the entire day and the important events of your life, if it leads to loss of interest, if it leads to other potential behavioral changes like uh, irritability, uh, sense of recluse, uh, loss of appetite, uh, perceived helplessness, and if that lasts for a long period of time, then we can say that the person can potentially slip into, slip into a depression. Yeah. 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 But sadness is a regular em emotion. I think all of us have felt sadness at different points of our life, and that is very common and natural. So let's not call it depression at all. No, no, no. Yeah. Being sad is just normal. Uh, Dr. Roy, over to you. Uh, so, sir, uh, what are the first measurements uh, measures in case you know someone has tried to commit suicide at home, especially? So, I guess the first few signs are, and this is something that you know I believe that most people mm -hmm. should have at least an exposure to, if not formal training, is what we call basic life support (BLS). So. It's a simple algorithm. It is applicable not only to depression or suicidal attempts at home, but to any sort of healthcare emergency at home. It is checking for somebody's circulation. It's CAB, circulation, airway, breathing. If anybody has had any sort of medical emergency at home and you're unsure about what they have done, the first few things we always check are CAB, circulation, airway, breathing. Check if they have okay. a pulse. That's what C stands for, circulation. A, airway, make sure that the mouth and nose and throat is clear so there's nothing in them. That stands for airway. And B is the last, is breathing. Make sure that they are breathing. This is the first thing that you do. Because these are the most, not only are the most essential activities you can perform, but the activities that you first have to check and clear and make sure are ongoing before anything else can be done, right? So it's far more complex to, you know, to teach basic life support. You need a full day course for that. But the first thing is check for breathing, uh, check for circulation, check for the airway, make sure there's nothing in the mouth and make sure they're breathing. Once these three things are assessed, then you have to understand what was the exact nature of the suicide attempt. Was it something like they tried to hang themselves? Did they take a bunch of poison pills? Did they, take, did they drink acid? Or, you know, uh, did they have an overdose of alcohol or any other psychotropic substance? Did they jump up a building? Is there any associated trauma? Did they step out in front of a car? Every of those things has its own separate algorithm. But it, at the end of it, it all comes down to check for circulation, check for airway, check for breathing. And if any of these are not going, you probably should start CPR. And that, and which is a whole different topic by itself. But it is something that is absolute, it's an essential skill. And honestly speaking, one, at least a minimum of one member in the family, or preferably two, should know. And, mm -hmm. and, and most hospitals, including Medica, we do offer this training in what we call BLS courses, basic life support courses that are offered. And can, in fact, can be offered through various organizations as well, as part of basic training to you know people living in societies, people living in houses in schools and colleges where this is essentially important because that's a high risk zone always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the most basic training that we've undergone. Right, sir. Right. Uh, uh, Anushila, uh, what could be, you know, uh, how do you uh, suggest, like, when it comes to the family members, so what should be the do's and don'ts for them when they have somebody, you know, around them? A person like, you know, who has already attempted a suicide. So what should, how should we treat them? Right. <laughs> so um, you asked me a question earlier. I'll get back to that and I'll take a little bit of uh, example and get into here this present question. So you asked about the primary reaction of a patient. Uh, some months back, Dr. Roy and I, uh, we both uh, were ha having this patient of attempted suicide case. and. Uh, I remember when I went to see her for the first time, she gave an unusual reaction. I talked about shame and guilt. Her first reaction was she was sitting on her bed in CCU and she was looking at me straight in the face and saying, 
do whatever you can. I'll get out of here. I'll do it again. OK, so now what is the family supposed to react? They were baffled. They were all over the place uh, thinking that what will they do with such a case? It is not a very um, common reaction, but such reactions can also happen. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a loss of a loved one, and she was so much in shock that she chose to attempt for suicide. And then fortunately, she was saved. But right after coming out uh, of the uh, critical condition, she, when she was conscious, that was, that was her first line. So under these circumstances, it is very normal for the family to panic. The, what, what is to be done? So the first thing under such a condition, or even when the patient is feeling repentant uh, about this uh, pursuit or attempt, it is very important for the family members to keep a passive eye on the patient. Uh, for example, the patient cannot be left alone unsupervised for a long period of time. But for an adult, it is not very nice to be supervised, especially when uh, the person is already feeling a little depressed or there is some form of stressors that the person is already encountering. They may ask and demand for some privacy. So what are the things that can be done? So the uh, family members have to be sensitized about uh, supervision or monitoring, but in a passive manner. It doesn't mean that if you have to keep an eye on a person, you have to sit on their head all the time. That, that can trigger them further, that can make them more irritable. And they will close up in their, within themselves and any form of communication will be uh, you know, uh, hampered. But there has to be an eye. So intermittent checking, uh, a distant call even, can also be a form of supervision. But supervision is necessary for at least a certain period of time until the rehabilitation process has ensured the stability of the mental health of the person. The next thing is when such a thing happens, there is a set of medication that is prescribed to the person. The medications have to be absolutely non-negotiably uh, supervised. Medications cannot be let alone with the patients. Either they will probably miss out on taking them or there may be a potential chance of a second attempt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next, next is when I said, uh, when the family feels a little stressed, they also start with, how could you do such a thing? You didn't think about us. Mm -hmm. This is a natural reaction. Instead, that can be replaced into we are here for you. There is something that has made you do such a thing, but how can we help you deal better with the situation? Take them to the mental health professionals that are the mental health services, if need, the uh, medical services, and take them through a healthy treatment procedure. It is not that now that my child is saved or my uh, my family member is saved let them take them back home and let's pretend that nothing has happened nothing because happened. There's, because there's a social taboo we, we tend to hide such incidents in the family we don't feel like talking about it we tend to hide it and we pretend like nothing has happened right. but the elephant is still there in the room mm -hmm. and it's important that we address that we take care of that elephant in the room so that future attempts can be uh, about it. So instead of shaming the person, instead of burdening them with guilt, it is very important for the family members to be empathetic and to provide them with necessary medical and psychological treatment uh, so that mm, the person can be rehabilitated. Saving a person from a case of attempt is an opportunity for us to actually save the loss of a life in the future. So when you say so the rehab person Huh, I'm so sorry. Uh, you go ahead. You go ahead with the question. Yeah. What were you saying? When, like you uh, mentioned about rehabilitation. So when should we exactly start this rehabilitation? Right in the hospital, like we do it in our hospital. Mm -hmm. So whenever there is a case um, that is coming to us, uh, I get a referral. 
So we start with an assessment. We start with the case history. We try to understand uh, what what is the nature of this attempt uh, and what are the potential stressors, what are the potential chances of future attempts. So we start with supportive therapy first, and then we go into the root. We identify the causes of the uh, attempt, and then uh, we start the rehabilitation process. So it the mental rehabilitation simultaneously starts with the physical rehabilitation. Right. So, as you said, uh, physical rehabilitation. So, sir, would you would you like to add a few points here? So, um, like Anushila said, the number one step to treating suicide is preventing suicide, right? So, there are always a bunch of markers that do show up. And let's just... Uh, the number one step is usually onset of depression. And, you know, there are a bunch of markers which will often show up. There are a bunch of questionnaires that, you know, if somebody does have the mental wherewithal that, you know, maybe I am depressed that they could probably go through. It's called PHQ-9. That's the most commonly one used to say, you know, what am I depressed? Sometimes you may not even know you're depressed. Like, I guess you asked Anushila a question, right? What's the difference between being sad and being depressed? Like, you know, I failed an exam. Okay. Are you sad about it? Yes, you would be sad. But are you depressed about it? It's a spectrum, right? Where does it stop being sadness? And when does it become depression? And, you know, there are a bunch of, like I said, so something that as friends that we can ever see is, is a person having like decreased interest in things or what we call having anhedonia, anhedin which is loss of interest or loss of pleasure. Does a person seem obviously down? Does he seem depressed? I like very flat, what do you call flat effect, you know, they really don't seem interested in the world. Or, you know, they just persistently have no hope in anything, you know, what, why do it? There's no point. What's the point of doing this? At the end, it doesn't matter anyways. Saying stuff like this, right? Which is a clear change in the way from their usual behavior. There's some people who always speak like that. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the sudden change in behavior. You know, somebody that, you know, not been sleeping much or, you know, people are always sleepy changes in level of energy. You know, your friend used to be very energetic, very active, is now, maybe your close friend is confided in you. You know, there's been a recent stressor in their family and now they're less energetic. You know, they're just, they're not, they're not out to hang out with you all. You know, they're just, they're just not interested in engaging with. So these are some of the signs we can see. Are they sleeping all the time? Are they eating more than usual or eating less than usual, right? Mm -hmm. It depends on how they adapt to stress. If they're always saying, you know, they're saying, you know what, I'm sorry that you have to be my friend. Like Anushila mentioned before, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a burden on you. You know, sometimes I feel I'm a burden on others. You know, if I ever get sick and go to the hospital, you know, don't bother putting me on the ventilator or don't bother taking care of me. I don't want to be a burden on the rest of you. And that is a difference in the way that they regular, they're normally very cheerful, happy people. Uh, suddenly, you know, they can't concentrate on things. Suppose you're in an office and you're the boss and, you know, you had a well-to-do employee who, you know, was excelling at his job and suddenly can't make a PowerPoint presentation or an Excel sheet. You know, there's a sudden drop in their performance as an employee, you know, like what you, and you might know yeah. if they might be going through divorce, somebody in the family dies, so you are aware there's a recent stressor. These are signs and symptoms that you can easily pick up on. You know, Remember, even a sudden, even a sudden spontaneous spur of the decision, there is some underlying stressor that there is going on. It's not like somebody who's happy, cheerful, you know, just got the best job on earth is suddenly going to go and jump off on the or walk in front, walk out in front of a train. There will be some underlying pathology going on there. So you know, and you can often look up these tests. You know, it's called PHQ nine or something similar. Uh, but they, these are the basic headings that will come under. And these are very, very accurate tests. These are very, very largely valid. They've had a large group of people validate them and they work really well. So that is one mode of prevention. And like Anushila mentioned earlier, social taboo, right? The social taboo under be, being, being labeled as depressed is what actually leads to a lot of people not coming out and discussing their depression with a psychiatrist, with a psychologist, with a friend, with a colleague, because then they'll think you're a mental case. It's a, they say you have mental disease and you have a brain disease. You know, you need to go to a, you need to go to a mental hospital. So it's a social taboo that's associated with it. You go to the West, they prescribe uh, antidepressants like it's salt. In yeah. fact, there are jokes that you should be putting antidepressant in the salt over there. 
so it's that common because let's face it mental disease is no different than physical disease there is no difference we've heard the word psychosomatic basically meaning you know like the, you know how people say to live in a healthy mind to have a healthy mind you need to have a healthy body but the opposite is true as well to have a healthy body you need to have a healthy mind so the two are in extra uh, other they're completely linked you cannot have one without the other so to have this mental taboo and face it depression is a mental taboo in india as much as we might want to agree or disagree on it it's what the fact is so the number one step in treating depression is preventing depression we keep saying prevention better than cure how do i not want how do i want to ensure you know a person doesn't die of depression in the hospital or you know suicide in the hospital is a prevented to begin in the first place otherwise you know they were went and got in a car accident they jumped in front of a train they have broken bones they have damaged lungs they have damaged kidneys they have damaged livers in a liver transplant in a kidney transplant they need to spend multiple months in the hospital and that of very often is a self worsening circle they were depressed to begin with due to unknown stressor they survived their they survived their suicide attempt and now they have further injuries that just adds to the loop and the third one was which have in fact these recently got rid of is that committed attempted suicide was actually a criminal offense in india you could be sent to jail for, for attempting to commit suicide where they were better actually you know people are like you know what i was better off had i succeeded because at least i would not have had to go to jail then so unfortunately that has now been you know stripped by the supreme court and that is no longer legal law in india so i think we are making some progress but at the essence of it it is d r d we need to desensitize people it's okay we understand it's okay to be depressed and it's okay to strong it, it is okay to seek treatment for depression rather than seeking treatment for suicide or suicide prevention it's better to seek treatment it's okay you could be depressed you know what you could have lost a loved one you're sad some people can't cope with their sadness or they may not have coping mechanisms or they may, may not be as fortunate as the rest of us to have very very strong coping mechanisms and you know some of it's okay to treat, seek help for that but unfortunately that is not the case in india right now and that is i think where we really need to move to because what's the treatment for dengue not getting dengue to begin with right yes i can treat i could treat you with platelets but i would rather you know first spray anti mosquito treatment to make sure you don't get bitten by mosquito the same way with depression yes i could i could try to heal you after you have tried to commit suicide but my preferred agent would be making sure you don't try something like that so true absolutely we we have a few questions sir uh, also anushila we have a few questions from our viewers uh bishaka ghosh is asking how frequent should therapy be for a patient who feels suicidal not necessarily that the person has attempted suicide would you like to address this anshila yeah okay the um, thank you for the question because it's very important uh, i would like to make a distinction between uh, a true suicidal ideation and casual talking about suicide say for example i had a really bad fight with my spouse and i was like i don't want to live anymore so am i actually having a suicidal ideation or it was just a venting out of my ag aggressive feeling at that moment i'm just angry on my spouse and i just said such a thing do i mean it do i or not it is often very difficult to make this distinction so i would 100% go back to the previous um, uh, narrative of dr roy here it is very important to un identify the underlying causes a suicidal attempt or a suicide is even if it's a planned thing or a spur of a moment thing it has a chronic pathology going on for a long period of time and if such a thing is happening it has to be addressed to prevent any form of attempt now how frequently the therapy should go on depends on the case depends on the kind of stressors uh, and the condition of the patient but uh, usually uh, a psychological uh, intervention uh, happens every uh, week 
in certain cases it can be biweekly also and gradually as the condition gets better it can uh, be shifted into a maintenance phase where the patient is not taking therapy on a regular basis but they are having checkups intermittently but initially the usual uh, therapy per protocol is once a week or twice a week kind of a situation um, apart from that uh, the family is also involved often in the therapy of such conditions but that the major problem is when even when the patients are coming to us uh, to take therapy they are very very uh, defensive and secretive about their therapy procedure because of the taboo situation that is there so the sensitization that is required for the family members for the peers and the, for the near and dear ones can uh, often get deterred because of their lack of consent because the patients often um, refuse to involve their family members in the therapy procedure they often feel that they will be looked down upon if they are taking therapy for the uh, underlying stresses they are handling and as a result in many circumstances what happens is the chronic pathology keeps developing further and that can lead to a fatal condition so it is very important for us to understand that just like when we get fever it is okay for us to go to the doctor and get some medication if we are feeling stress we don't even have to go to depression if we are feeling stress and we are finding it difficult to cope with it is okay to seek professional help so that it doesn't build up further family members when they participate in the therapy process the chances of success become significantly higher is very important to identify the problem yes yes so we have a very interesting question from uh, ms soma bhan and the question is what are the reason for people to live stream their suicide are they actually asking to be rescued hello hello uh yes anushila could you hear me hello may i repeat the question for you anushila uh shani i i couldn't hear you can you please repeat the question again yeah absolutely so the question is from ms soma bhan the question is what is the reason for people to live stream their suicide are they actually asking to be rescued i'm i'm so sorry i can't hear you uh shaini uh i think there's a problem in the network can you hear me anushila yes 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 ma'am i can hear you tell me ma'am okay the question was from me i don't know somehow you seem to have lost connection with shaini my question was that we often see people live uh -huh. streaming their suicide attempts on facebook you know and stuff like that so what is the reason for that are they actually asking mm -hmm. for help what is the reason they live stream it thank you for the question ma'am uh, uh because it's a very complicated um, foundation of this behavior there are different reasons that can lead to such a behavior the primary one being making a statement if a person is trying to um uh, live stream like show the world like look i am exiting it can be a statement of i have felt uh, invisible or unattended in a long period of time and then i am exiting and th that is like a note to the world that hope you notice it now it is uh, it can be a product of chronic depressive feeling sometimes when people commit suicide because of social reasons committing a suicide uh, can also be like a like an attempt to show the world that this was my agenda basically it is an attention seeking behavior it is an attempt to draw the uh, world's attention towards the agenda that the person is trying to make and it can also be a form of crying out for help sometimes there are people who start live streaming or they may they leave messages or they make calls uh, before they are trying to 
go for it there is a subtle uh, streak of thought present in them where they probably feel that if someone tries to uh, save them it is kind of a way of seeking validation that i am still important to the people in the world that they would make an effort to save me that's why the suicide prevention cells are so effective because at when we are at a complete uh, loss of hope and we are feeling that we are not being able to go on anymore that one phone call can bring us back to life because during that phone call the hope or the loss of reason at that moment can be reinstated and an attempt can be stopped but live streaming calling videoing or sending out messages it can be interpreted as a subtle call for attention thank you anushila anushila can you hear me yes i can shine okay so uh, we have uh, another question a very similar question of uh, uh raised by uh, ms sunipa sengupta and abhishek lal and the question is why is this tendency also becoming uh, very common among children these days and also are we as parents responsible for it well uh, once again very uh, relative question um the lifestyle the modern life has become very fast and very complicated under these circumstances that uh, the the kind of challenges children are facing is very different from the times that uh, the earlier times that the times that we have grown up in or our parents have grown up in the in this new set of uh, challenging situation the virtual world has a major role to play also because our worlds have become very isolated within our rooms within our close circles and we have become very very individualistic in nature and as a result we have become further secretive and the pressure of performing the pressure of putting up a certain image has become very very high and that uh, also puts a lot of pressure on the uh, students when they are performing when they are being in a certain way in front of their peer groups when they are being in a certain way in front of their parents teachers living up to their expectations that might seem a lot overwhelming for them and if you talk about the parents yes in terms of adolescent suicide cases parents has an important role to play we were talking a while before that what the family members can do the parents can create an avenue for the children to talk about their stresses the, pre, the parents can create an avenue for children to create a safe space for them to talk about anything and everything that they are going through for example when children they often fall prey to certain uh, embarrassing incidents for which they cannot talk to anyone they cannot reach out to anyone and they fear that if the parents get to know their um, conditions or their the situation they are dealing with uh, they will be heavily reprimanded such fears can also re- lead to an attempt to suicide so uh, parents have a very important role if they can make sure that the children can feel free to reach out to them and can talk to them about anything and everything such a safe environment can assure the children of our time that whatever goes wrong they have a place to go back to and that can save them from such attempts right so uh, one of our viewers uh, she has commented miss uh, shri moi few that do change the word commit to commit to dying by suicide suicide is not a crime by using the word committed we are only taking the conversation away from mental health mm. i i appreciate your shri moi i appreciate uh, shrimoy's um, comment because i think uh, an attempt for suicide or a suicide shouldn't be looked upon as a crime at all the, dr roy also mentioned a while ago that supreme court has also given a verdict uh, against it because yes. it is it is not someone's uh, attempt to harm anyone else by harming themselves we have to be very very empathetic in the process of rehabilitation we have to know that this per- nobody wants to die nobody wants to end their life 
they only feel a certain amount of futility or per lack of purpose and then a certain amount of hopelessness within themselves that they feel that it is easier to end their lives than to go on with it. We would really like to hear from Dr. Roy also on this. Hi. So I guess there's a question of some time ago, right? Of what is the right amount of therapy mm -hmm. that uh, somebody should undergo mm. after a suicide attempt? And the uh, I, I, Anushi, I did answer that, uh, but that was a little bit further down the line. The question then comes down to how committed is the person to undergoing the act, right? Say somebody took a bunch of pills. They're in the hospital, they're on a ventilator for a bunch of days and uh, they wake up and, uh, you know, we go and ask them, so you know what you did? Like, yeah, I like, took a bunch of pills to try to kill myself. Like, okay, I understand that. I'm sorry. Like, are you sure you would not try to do this again? And they're like, no, I'd go home and take another bunch of pills. Are you going to discharge the patient home with follow-up to uh, psychiatry after a week? No, right? So the question then becomes, how severe or how intense is the drive or the feeling and are they safe going back to where they are they may not be safe to go back home or to go back to their current living situation right they might need 24 7 attention they might need continuous monitoring for a few weeks it's what we call commitment right you might have to come involuntary versus voluntary commitment where you might say you know what you're an actual active risk to yourself you may not be safe to go back home because that might be the depth of their despair at some at some level. They're like, you know what? I tried, I failed, I'm gonna go back and try again. You're not gonna send them back home with this. So the right uh, the right amount of his of, of of psychotherapy or psychological therapy is as much as it's needed to make that person safe again, right? I'm not gonna like somebody come I can give the example for dengue. Like you might somebody ask me, what's the right amount of platelets for dengue? I'm like, I don't know. I give one and stop and like, that's mm -hmm. it. I'll see them after a week. No, I admit them to the ICU if needed. The same way for mental health. The right amount is how much ever they need. It might be once a week, once or once a month. It might be group sessions, it might be family sessions, it might be alone sessions, or it might be 24 sessions with 24 hour monitoring with nurses and paramedical staff, keeping a continuous eye on them with continuous medication, maybe IV, maybe I am, maybe oral tablets on a daily basis, still you can figure out what's actually going on. So I think that's the main thing that people, in, it, there is no difference in the pathology of treating mental disease as there is treating physical disease. There is no difference. I know we keep having this thing like, oh, you know, a hospital, we are not a hospital to treat psychological condition. Yes, but when you are having acute crisis, there is no difference between the two. Even the definition of health, is not only physical but mental well-being, taking care of their economic, social, social and economic activities as well. So this is just as essential a part of health as being physically fit. Mm -hmm. Right. So another question from uh, from Ms. Apala Datta, and the question is: As I understand, depression is the main cause of suicide. Is suicidal tendency genetic too, in some cases, or does it run in the family? So yeah. yeah. I, I mentioned this earlier uh, once, if there is a um, history of suicide attempts or suicide in the family, yes, it increases the potential chances of a person trying to commit, uh, uh, I'll uh, I'll refer to Srimoy again, I wouldn't say commit. Yes. Um, uh, an attempt of suicide can be more probable in a person undergoing any stressful condition. But uh, the previous thing, if uh, depression is the uh, underlying condition of, or not, yes, it is an underlying condition, but it is also a, po a possibility that generally, I am not a person who is experiencing depression but suddenly if there is a drastic change in my life which has caused some emotional trauma in me that can also trigger me to take an attempt right anushila uh, so may i, I ask our viewers your mic yes sir yeah so so the question was uh, whether it's a genetic component or not, right? Mm -hmm. 
So let me counter that by asking you this question. Do people drink alcohol? Yes, some people do, Absolutely. some people don't. Absolutely. But why does everybody not become an alcoholic? Right? Addiction. Not yeah. everyone is. Some people get addicted, some people don't. Yeah. Similarly, yeah. if depression was a mental disease, why do we have pills for it? The very fact that pills are effective in depression implies that there is a biochemical component means there is something there is something off in the brain that the pills are are managing to convert or co correct which makes them feel better mm -hmm. right so if there is some chemical imbalance somewhere that pills are helping to correct then they can be a genetic component to that so oh, yes. if i was born with a condition that i may have a mm -hmm. few less receptors for some chemical there is no reason that my future my offspring mm. could not be born with that same condition so it's not the tendency to commit suicide that is genetic it is a likelihood that you're going to suffer from depression that is genetic and being depressed puts you at a higher risk for attempting suicide yeah very it's nicely like cancer yeah. Not mm -hmm. everybody with a certain gene will get lung cancer, but having lung, but having that gene and smoking will give you lung cancer. So the same way, it's a combination of both genetic. It's like any, it's like any other disease. It's a combination of both genetic factors as well as what we call environmental factors External. or acquired factors. What socioeconomic status you live in, what's the socioeconomic condition, plus in addition to where you are coming from, so that. Otherwise, you know, why would you give pills to a depressed person? They should just go and talk to a psychiatrist. Medication should not be a part of your therapy at all, but it is very effective. It works very, very well. So we must understand there is a physical component which we tend to overlook to all of this as well, which is, the, and that's the reason, and that is why it's so easily treatable. And it's sad that, you know, nobody actually seeks treatment because of the taboo associated with it. It is no different at some level than having hypertension. Why are you hypertensive? Why are you diabetic? Oh, my father was diabetic. My mother is diabetic. I'm diabetic too. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you could be depressed because, you know, maybe your father and mother were both had depressive tendencies or were depressed as well. But because it's, there's so much taboo in India, they just never discussed it. In India, we don't have, when the last time you heard anybody depress, depress, discuss depression at home, you know what, mom, I'm depressed. Like, shut up and go do your homework. You don't have... You have too much free time. That's why you're sitting and thinking about this. Go do your work or go do your homework and stop thinking all this. That's the standard answer you might get as a teenager. If you're sad and you want to discuss, mom, I'm really sad or dad, I'm really sad. I think I might be depressed. And like, you're not, we know we are not giving you enough work. Go do the dishes. So that's what it comes down to. Do not overlook the physical aspect of mental disease, which is what we do in India. Like, no, it does not exist. The, okay. Have you heard of ostriches? I'm sure you've heard of ostriches. Yes. What does the ostrich do when attacked by prey? Yeah. It puts its head in the sand. Mm -hmm. Because if it can't yeah. see it, it's not there. What happens to that ostrich after it puts its head in the sand? It gets eaten anyways. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right? So putting your head in the sand is not treatment. It's not like, oh, if I, if I can't see it, it's not there. It's very much there. It's going to come and eat you. Brilliantly explained, no, Nishila. Yeah. Really. Exactly. I can't agree any more better. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. Really. So right. Uh, I, can, I can ask uh, the viewers uh, if, they, if they have anything to, to question, to, to kind of put forward. Please go ahead. Meanwhile, we have uh, we have one more question also. That is, uh, we have discussed this, but still, I'll take this question. Person uh, can a person who has attempted suicide once again uh, repeat? Uh, like we have discussed before. We have. So, 
if um, if not rehabilitated if the underlying reason of that attempt was not addressed the chances of further attempts is very high yes very much like um, i mean dr roy has very nicely explained the whole idea attempting suicide is only the reaction but the thing is brewing inside in the form of depression or the in, in the form of any uh, chronic mental illness if that bit is not addressed after the first attempt if the patient is not going through emotional rehabilitation the chances of further attempts is very high i think uh, dr roy can add better yeah um, the number one risk factor for somebody attempting suicide is prior attempt it's that simple yeah mm -hmm. oh i don't have nothing to add it's just that one simple thing <laughs> most likely risk factor is prior attempt mm -hmm. There is one more question from Ms. Rupali Majumdar. The question is, how helpful are exercise and medication in combating depression? So first, would you like to address uh, no, and I then hope... we'll go to Anushila. Again, it depends on the underlying condition, right? I am depressed because my girlfriend broke up with me. Okay, that is a reason to, that is a reason to be sad. The fact that you're depressed is probably a having a, what we call dysthymia or a dysregulated response everybody at sooner or later undergoes some sort of heartbreak right so the very fact is you're having this response is it dysregulated so i'm sorry what is the question again so the question is how helpful are exercise and medication in combat right so the question then becomes if the underlying reason is my girlfriend broke up with me i'm so sad i'm going to try to kill myself how effective do you think meditation and exercise would be? Maybe not as much. Maybe as a part of a general practice of, you know, helping calm yourself, help, help meditating, being mindful is a good practice to kind of help people reason and understand and be at peace with who they are would help. But in acute stressor, it may not be so good. So the right question would be, does exercise and meditation help with the treatment of depression? And the answer there is emphatic, definite yes. Because it helps people be, exercise helps distract the mind. It helps focus your mind. When was the last time you were doing cardio and you were thinking about the stock market or, you know, who's dating whom or, you know, what dress was what wearing at the Met Gala? No. You're just focused on trying to breathe and trying to lift that weight and, you know, not injure yourself when you're really exercising. The entire purpose of meditation is emptying your mind of all thought and just being at peace with yourself. So these are great treatments to help control your basically mindfulness and basically to focus your mind. It is great. So it is great at managing depression. It's not going to be acute treatment for what you call acute distress or acute uh, and acute and in any acute episode exercise meditation is not going to help over there. But it's it is going to help in reducing the risk of something like that happening. It is like working out and exercising and meditating is going to boost your immunity. So if you were to get sick, you're not going to get severely ill. It's going to reduce the risk. It's not going to prevent it. But, you know, when somebody has COVID, I'm not going to be like, you know what, you should go and meditate and, you know, hit the gym. No, no, no. I'm going to admit to you and I'm going to give you treatment for that. But I'm going to say once you recover, I want you to exercise more. I want to meditate and concentrate your breathing and get good habits. Mm -hmm. Good as chronic therapy, as background therapy, once the acute condition has dissipated and resolved. Anushila? I would 100% agree with him. Meditation is a relaxation tool. And from exercises, there are certain hormones generated called endorphins, which help us deal better with our stress hormones. Uh, these are relief, relief mechanisms. Temporary relief can be uh, generated, but it is true if I am feeling strangled 
a back massage cannot help me it would be like the back massage it is nice under regular circumstances but if i am feeling strangled i have to be able to breathe first i have to remove that thing that is strangling me so that will be the underlying cause that is making me feel so severely uh, helpless or distressed so uh, these the, these are different uh, tools they may facilitate the rehabilitation procedure but the root cause has to be identified so whatever the root cause is that has to gain the primary attention and that would be it very interesting uh, you know anushila uh, i was just uh, you know browsing and uh, by the way miss uh, shrimui pyu who uh, you know uh, commented uh, who mentioned the uh, comment so she yeah. is basically uh, she she is an acclaimed journalist and columnist on gender and sexuality so i'm aware pleasure, uh, to introduce you to this uh, webinar so it was great hearing from you so so yeah thank you shrimoy for joining us yeah so she is watching the show and uh, and yeah so so uh, any questions from our viewers it was a brilliant brilliant session it such a such an interesting topic it was so ma'am uh, miss Ms. Apala Dutta, I would uh, request you to to say a few words. Good evening. Uh, more than being interesting, I found a lot of introspection was being done, and of course, what I uh, really liked was Anushila spoke about you know sadness and chronic sadness. This is something which uh, you know everyone should know when you feel sad and when you, the sadness becomes chronic, and as you said, Anushila tends to. change your life with the behavioral changes and dr roy the way you answered my question on whether you know suicide is genetic or not i i i found it a brilliant way of expressing and that would be my take away for the evening when we join such webinars we think what is going to be spoken about am i going to feel sad or are these things going to uh, you know um, in me there might, something in me will be turned on which will make me feel more sad but this webinar was a, a very different take a very very different take and what i really liked at the end was the what dr roy again said the biochemical component treat it with a pill do not sit there looking at it because the taboo in indian society is very strong and i'm 100% sure every family knows someone who has been in depression and tried to hide it we know maybe it's not an immediate family and one thing i've noticed in uh, dr roy and anushila both that And these people are depressive. I don't know why it happens, but they tend to sleep a lot during daytime. I'm talking from close observation, from and they, and they and they do not want to take a bath. I've noticed a cycle uh, from someone very close. I don't know why it happens, but uh, what you spoke today it um, made a lot of sense. And I hope the social taboos break. And today, our Supreme Court has. taken away that uh, what and commit hasn't been taken away but suicide is no more a crime so maybe the society is moving forward india is moving forward and maybe webinars like this will be more open to public in the future and more receptive and thank you medica for this wonderful insightful webinar thank you uh, ma'am i would take a moment i would take a moment uh, to uh, thank you for this observation because not taking bath is basically an indicator that the person is neglecting self care that is one of the indicators although it cannot be absolute people are very good at camouflaging like i mentioned earlier but yes not taking a bath not eating properly not sleeping properly are important indicators and what you just asked that they don't sleep at night they sleep more during the day is if you look into the stats of it you will see that nights and early mornings are very very prone to chronic depressive feelings so that's why they find it particularly difficult when uh, when it is night time when the re rest of the world is sleeping they become more um, in close contact with their depressive feelings depressive thoughts and that can make it difficult for them to pass the night and then it, they find it difficult to sleep and then as the morning sets in they 
often tend to doze off. Thank you for this observation, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, to, uh, to, to just add a few sentences to what Nushila said, there's a very aptly named disorder called seasonal affective disorder called SAD, SAD, most commonly seen in countries which are higher latitudes, which have winters with long periods of nighttime. Daytime in is day's activity, night is rest. So that is why late evenings, darkness, night, and daytime, dawn is associated with you've finished your daily activities. You know, you have more time to yourself, so you have more time to reflect on your thoughts. And that is why, and our most of our festivals are clustered in the winter months, if you notice. So, and festivals are very, very stressful times. The high, you have highest rates of depression and suicide attempts around birthdays, around anniversaries, around wedding season, around Christmas season. I don't know who's going to call, who's going to ask, are they going to come to my birthday? Are people going to invite me for the Christmas party? If you're in the West, in America, for Thanksgiving is associated. So that is why these times are associated with much significantly higher rate of both depression as well as suicidal ideation and suicide oh, attempts. Is that so? Very yeah. interesting. Very interesting, yes. Very interesting. I never, I didn't know this at all. I mean, so we are almost towards the end of our session today. Oh, before we end, oh, of course, I will ask Anushila and Dr. Roy to to kind of say a few words and then we'll end the session. Right. Um, I think it's high time we pay attention to this agenda. And thank you for this um, discussion. I hope people Every discussion over this topic will be a step towards sensitizing ourselves and our people towards the importance of this matter, suicide. Um, UN has taken a lot of interest in the new SDG goals, Sustainable Development Goals, also by 2030. They have made the suicide rate as an important marker of mental health uh, and well-being as well. So, Worldwide, suicide is taken very seriously in the current time because of the modern changes that we are undergoing. The rate of suicide has gone up very high. And since the rate is also very high amongst the adolescents, it is very, very threatening to our future generation as well. If we can remove the taboo, if we can pay better attention, if we can openly talk about it, we can definitely come together and reduce this the occurrence of such unfortunate events. And th that's very important for us. I think my appeal to everyone would be to feel very comfortable and make other people feel comfortable in talking about their stressors, in talking about their depressive feelings, which can potentially lead them to a point where they feel there is no other way out. There is always a way out. We just need to reach out for help, find, declutter ourselves and find that way. So we need to come together in that process. That would be my take home. Reach out for help and yes, we should all be, you know, with each other, always. Yes, reaching out and also receiving people right. openly who are asking for help, yeah. That's it. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Roy? Thank you. First, I'd like to thank uh, the Rotary Club for hosting this event. And it's a very, very important, very, very relevant topic in our current times. And with the pandemic and with the advent of work from home, living in closed spaces, it, that is also a stressor, as we have discussed. That is a significant stressor. But uh, like uh, Anushila just mentioned, mental health is an essential part of health. Right. And it is one of the few forms of health where the treatment is just as simple as talking to someone, whether it be a close colleague, a close friend, a spouse, neighbor, or even a professional. There is nothing wrong with it. And there is nothing wrong in seeking therapy. 
in fact the treatment of choice is to seek what you call cognitive behavioral therapy is talking to someone and understanding that you know what you're going through is a probably quite normal normalizing it is the most important and it's okay uh treatment uh, prevention is better than treatment like medication is a treatment option but talking is the preferred choice i would rather talk to somebody rather than give them a pill or anything right i'd say you know what go to anushila talk to anushila see how she is let her like let her assess and say you know what this is really severe i may not be able to do this by myself i need i might need some assistance with medication but it's absolutely normal to talk to a colleague a friend or even a professional if you know you don't want to talk to your friends and family about what you're going through but it's absolutely normal it is no different than having fever it is no different from having a common cold it's no different from having a headache it's no different from you know playing football and getting kicked in the legs and you, know, you might need you have a fracture that you might need fixing it's a part of normal life and it has to be treated as a part of normal life and uh, it is important to give it importance but not to the point where you know it becomes taboo like you oh my god how did this happen to you we don't have do that to people with hypertension we don't do that to people with diabetes and we should not be doing it to people who have mental disease of any inter, of any sort at the end it's not their fault right so i think that's my closing remark absolutely sir thank you so much thank you dr roy thank you anushila for such a brilliant session i hope all our viewers uh, have found it very insightful thank you very much thank you everyone for being part of this webinar we shall see you soon thank you